Hi everyone. Today I'm going to cover the rotor response analysis and the mode shapes. As shown in this slide, I'm going to show you how to perform these rotor response analysis and how it is interpreted. Let's continue from the damped natural frequency map which was presented in the previous video in part 5. The bottom right figure is the rotor model that corresponds to the damp natural frequency map shown in this slide. To understand the rotor motion, you could first start with checking the mode shapes at each critical speed. The critical speed is where the shaft speed coincides with the natural frequency, and the first two mode shapes are shown on the right. The mode shapes indicates that at that critical speed, the shape of the rotor motion will resemble what is shown on the right. If you look into the first mode shape carefully, the first mode is elastic and the node point is near the bearing. Please note that the node is a location where the amplitude motion is zero, as you could see on the bottom right figure. This indicates that the bearing is stiff and it offers very little damping at the first critical speed. The damping ratio map is shown in the left bottom finger and it is showing a low damping ratio from the bearing support. Now let's look into the second mode shape. Unlike the first mode shape, the second mode shape has the node point at the center of the shaft. And if you look at the damped natural frequency map on the top left figure, the natural frequency decreases with increasing excitation frequency. This is because the bearing model was set to have decreasing stiffness with excitation frequency. The input of the bearing modeling is described in the previous video. And this decrease in bearing support stiffness increases the effective damping as shown in the damping ratio map in the bottom. Now let's perform the rotor response analysis using the Excel rotor software. But to perform the rotor response analysis, you first need to define the imbalance of the rotor. There are many ways to define the imbalance of the rotor but most widely used specifications are API standard and ISO grade. API is an abbreviation of American Petroleum Institute, and their imbalance spec is defined as four times the weight divided by the rotor speed. And this imbalance spec is equivalent to the ISO grade of 0.7. Another way to define the imbalance is using ISO 1940 spec. Many of the companies typically uses the grade G2.5 spec limit. So you could use either a simple equation, which is 15 times the weight divided by the rotor speed. Or you could use the figure shown on the left to find the allowable residual imbalance for grade 2.5 by simply drawing a line on the figure. For example, find the speed that you are interested in, which is 3000 RPM in our example, and draw a vertical line straight up to the grade G2.5. And then draw a horizontal line straight to the Y axis, which gives you the allowable imbalance for grade 2.5. So the calculated imbalance is shown on the top left, where the API standard is more stringent than the ISO G2.5 spec limit. In general, bigger machines with high speed operation and high pressure conditions tend to work well with API standard. But machines with less severe operating conditions, ISO grade of 2.5 works fine. Now, based on the calculated allowable imbalance, you could input those numbers into the rotor dynamic software. I'm going to set ISO spec limit as an input for the first case run. Then define the outputs of the locations you are interested in. I typically look into the bearing locations and mid-span locations as shown in the right figure. 
And of course, if you want to compare with the rotor dynamic test measurements, you could pinpoint the location of the probe sensors from the model. Once you run the response analysis, the outcome looks like this for using ISO grade imbalance. As I defined in the previous slide, the rotor responses are shown at the left bearing, at the middle of the rotor, and finally at the right bearing. If you look into the rotor response graph below, at first and second critical speeds, the rotor responses show peaks. And you can connect these motions with the mode shapes. As you could see in the top right corner, mode shape graph at first critical speed, the rotor mid-span shows the highest movement. And that corresponds with the rotor response plots shown in the below graph. This rotor response plot is very useful information to compare with the rotor measurements in the field. Now let's look into the responses at the second critical speed. As you could see at the middle of the rotor, there is a very small movement at the second critical speed around 9000 RPM. This is because the rotor mid-span is the node at the second critical speed. Also, one more thing to note here is that the second peak at the bearing locations are also smaller than the first peak. This is because if you remember in the previous slide in the damping ratio map, the bearing support provides higher damping ratio at the second critical speed. So a higher damping is reducing the amplitude motion at the second critical speed. Now, what if we input the API standard allowable imbalance limit to the model? To understand this, you need to update the imbalance amount in the rotor dynamic model and run the model. And here is the result of the rotor response with both imbalance spec. And as expected, the rotor motion is smaller with the smaller imbalance. Every company has its own imbalance spec limit based on the history of success of their products. And again, the bigger machines with high speed operation and high pressure conditions tends to work better with API standard, but machine with less severe operating conditions, ISO grade of G2.5 works fine. Today, I covered a topic related to the rotor responses and the mode shapes and imbalance specifications. In my next video, I'll cover the topic related to the rotor responses and the amplification factors. Thanks for watching.